آرا چارلز دیکنز ادوارد گیبنز تومس کارلائل and the list goes on and on and on Christians who have spoken about Ashura and who have talked about the significance of Karbala you have Hindus who commemorate the event of Ashura in India they come out in their droves in thousands and thousands and they commemorate this event in a manner that resembles the way we commemorate it when it comes to the event of Ghadir you have Christians you have Zoroastrians you have individuals who subscribe to no faith perhaps who commemorate the legend that is Ali ibn Abi Talib who even specifically commemorate Ghadir in countries like Lebanon and others so it's not these two events being Ghadir and Ashura are not exclusive to the Shia and that's a known fact it's not even up for debate what is exclusive to us is Fatimiyyah it's Fatimiyyah that sets us apart it's the commemoration of the martyrdom of Fatima to Zahra that makes us unique in its commemoration that's number one number two reason as to why should we ever be forced to choose one event to commemorate the answer would be Fatimiya the second reason for that is that Fatimiya makes it such that it makes sense it's because of Fatimiya that our history starts to reveal itself it's because of Fatimiya that even Ashura and Ghadir begin to make sense without Fatimiya Ashura would have been a cataclysmic event an earth-shattering occurrence it would have changed the course of history as it does it would have been something that is mentioned in history books forever and ever no doubt but it would have left Ashura as this mysterious enigmatic unexplainable event again remove Fatimiya from the equation remove the attack on the house of prophethood remove the ambush on the home of Fatima and Ali Ashura doesn't make much sense Ashura would have been extremely mystifying and enigmatic people would have struggled we would have struggled to explain what exactly happened in Ashura how could the nation that proclaims a fellowship to the Holy Prophet and who stood up to pray in celebration after they killed and massacred Abu Abdullah al Hussein. That's how they celebrated their victory. They all got up and they prayed to Allah. How could this nation murder the grandson of this Prophet? We would have been confused until the day of judgment. It's only when you take into consideration Fatimiyya that it begins to make sense. It's only when you think that this snowball was actually thrown on the day of Saqifah and it ended up picking up more and more snow and dirt and rocks and pebbles until it all materialized on the 10th day of Muharram in the year 61 after the Hijrah of the Holy Prophet. Only then will you realize that this arrow came from the direction of the Saqifah. And so Fatimiya is absolutely critical to our worldview. Fatimiya 
is what allows us to make sense of the madness, the chaos, the mayhem, the pandemonium that transpired after the death of the Holy Prophet And so once again, if we were to choose, it would have to be Fatimiyya. Some people call Fatimiyya the second Ashura. But I posit that it has to be even before Ashura. Some people call the ninth of Rabi'ah the second Ghadir. But the ninth of Rabi'ah again makes it all clear. And incidentally, they both relate to Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. So with that introduction, I guess the next thing is to look at who Fatima to Zahra actually was and why her role was so instrumental. Why does Fatima to Zahra acquire this significant position in our history, in our belief, in our world view? Now, if you happen to be someone who doesn't subscribe to the Ahlul Bayt school of thought, then obviously there's going to be confusion. Someone used to say he happened to be on the opposing side, only to then switch sides and embrace the Ahlul Bayt. He used to say that when I was a part of that uh, sect prior to becoming a, a Shia, he said, back then, you learn about Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein only when they were children. It's almost like they never really grew up. They remain children. Because the only stories you hear about them are stories when they surrounded the Prophet. Stories about how they would come and play with their grandfather and spend time with their father and mother and so forth. And at that time, Imam al Hassan was only seven years old. Imam al Hussein was six months younger. Zainab alayhi salam was a young child. It's almost as though al Hassan and al Hussein never really grew up. Because the minute you start to approach the time when they did grow up to become adults, the second you talk about the time when they played a significant role as adults, that's when things, the water becomes murky. And that's when you have to answer some inconvenient questions. And nobody wants to answer inconvenient questions. Right? You see, the reason I said Fatimiyya is so critical before I go on, is notice how the other side deals with Fatimiyya. When it comes to Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam, nobody denies that his family and his brothers and his children and even his infant were massacred on the plains of Karbala. No one can deny that. Partly because it was reported so widely. Every historian, the earliest sources have all talked about this event. There were 30,000 witnesses. It's not something that you could just whitewash or sweep under the carpet, right? So they don't deny the fact that it took place. They don't even deny that it was specific individuals who participated in the actual massacre. It was people who went out there, who killed Imam al Hussein. Their names are known, their affiliations are known. Everybody knows who these people were. Although, of course, they will try to manipulate the general public by saying that, oh, but Yazid wasn't directly responsible, it was Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and so on and so forth, right? So they'll, obviously there is some manipulation here. There is some tampering happening in history to suit their causes and to suit their agenda. But no one denies the actual event. When it comes to Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam, all of a sudden they become extremely defensive, don't they? All of a sudden, the Rafalis are deceivers, they're liars, they're cheaters, they're exaggerators, none of this happened. Why get so defensive about it though? I mean, it's not like your idols didn't kill other companions of the Prophet. Fatima to Zahra wasn't the only person killed by those same individuals that you're trying, you're bending over backwards to try and defend. Malik ibn Nuwayra was a companion of Rasulullah. And one of the first things the coup leaders did was ambush 
the village of Malik ibn Nuwayra, murdered him, decapitated him, took his severed head and threw it under a pot and boiled the pot from night until dusk. And then they came back saying, hang on a second, what, what just happened? A companion of the Prophet, someone about whom the Prophet had said, if you wish to see someone who is from paradise, look at this man. They all looked and it was Malik ibn Nuwayra. Right? So the first killed Malik ibn Nuwayra. The second, the third, even Abu Dhar was one of the people that they murdered, even though they did so indirectly. They literally starved him to death. So it's not like Fatima to Zahra was the only person that they actually killed. Muawiyah then came and he murdered the companions of the Prophet in droves again. All of a sudden, the sanctity that they give to the companions is dialed way down when it comes to Muawiyah being the killer and the perp. So, what's so special about Fatima to Zahra? Why get so defensive about that? Because that is indefensible. There's literally no way you can justify the murder of an 18-year-old woman who, by the way, happened to be the daughter of the Holy Prophet How would you justify that? How would you even talk about that? Again, these are extremely inconvenient questions that nobody wants to ask and certainly nobody wants to answer. So who was Fatima? Again, if you're confused and you don't know, what do you do? You go to your most authoritative corpus of hadith. You go to Sahih Bukhari, right? As someone who subscribes to that. I actually looked, at, I looked this up and it's mind-blowing. There's just so much to say about this, right? But in the interest of time, I'll focus on just a couple of points. Bukhari has a chapter called Babu Fadl al-Sahaba the chapter on the virtues of the companions. Fatima to Zahra is listed under that heading. In other words, there's nothing special about Fatima. If anything, she was just a companion. And she's the one before the last on that list. Fine. You open the chapter, Babu Fadli Fatima. You'd think that the only surviving daughter of the Prophet, the mother of his only lineage, the one about whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks in the Quran when he says, Wanisa ana wanisa akum. Let's go and bring our women, and who does the Prophet take along? None other than Fatima, even though he had a, a whole flock of women he could have taken along with him. Fatima is the only one. You'd think the one about whom the Prophet said Fatima to Ummu Abiha, the one whose virtues are endless, the one who had a long queue of suitors and people who came to propose to her, people trying to win her over with their money, with their wealth, with their influence. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf was the richest companion. So filthy rich in fact that when he died, they had to use axes to break up his gold and jewelry so they could distribute it to the inheritors of the estate. He came to the Holy Prophet. He said to him, you're asking for 500 dirhams. I'm here to announce that I'm willing to give 10,000 gold dinars. That's 100,000 dirhams, right? And I'll give you 100 camels. And I'll give you this and I'll give you that. فَغَضِبَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ do you know who says this, by the way? The one who reports this hadith is at tabari in his Dala'il al-Imamah from the 5th century after Hijrah. He says the Prophet was infuriated at the suggestion that he was willing to part with the soul that sits between his two flanks. Fatima tu bada'atum minni, Fatima tu ruhi allati bayna jambay in exchange for some money. But just look at the mentality. Look at how they view this world and how they viewed the Prophet, these hypocrites. The Prophet said to him, are you trying to buy her from me? He extended his hand to the ground and he took a handful of pebbles. فَقَلَبَهَا ذَهَبًا وَفِضَّةً 
the Holy Prophet immediately transformed the pebbles into solid gold. He said to him, you think I, I need your money? You think I want your wealth? The Holy Prophet and Fatima and Ali and the Ahlul Bayt know more than anyone. Man tazawwaja If you marry someone for their wealth, God will abandon you to her wealth. If you have a problem next time, don't come to God asking for help. As the hadith says, and if you marry someone for their looks, for their beauty, then you will see something in her or him that is truly hideous and disgusting. You'll be repulsed by what you find. But if you marry someone for their religiosity, there's a lesson in this, brothers and sisters, especially for the youth, those who are looking to get married. I know this culture conditions us to look for certain traits and look for certain attributes and characteristics that fall into one or more of these categories that the hadith just mentioned. Don't fall for that. Look for religion. Look for, for, th for things that have true lasting value, not things that are transient and are going to go away at some point or another. Anyway, You'd think that someone like Fatima to Zahra, who has all these suitors and who have all of these people coming to propose to her and ask her hand in marriage, would be spoken about at length by Sahih Bukhari. You'd think so, wouldn't you? Do you know how many hadiths he mentions in that chapter about the virtues of Fatima to Zahra? Take a wild guess. Two. Two hadiths. Honestly, when I first saw it, I kept flipping the pages of the book to see if I'm missing something. I thought there must be some missing pages here or something, right? Two hadith. Unbelievable. Even when it comes to Aisha's virtues, Al-Bukhari mentions four times as many hadith. He's got a total of eight. Which, weirdly, most of them compare her to food items. Right? But that's another subject for another day. The point here is, Fatima to Zahra only gets two hadith. So you know already that the redactions and the censorships and the covering of the truth has been in full swing. And yet after all that, right, you still can't deny these two virtues of Fatima. These two hadith just couldn't be redacted because it would be ridiculous. Because it would be too obvious. Because everyone would know where this person stands. So we had to include something. And in these two ahadith, we have plenty to go by. Hadith number one, he says, Fatima, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Fatima tu bav'atun minni man adaha, say it with me, faqad adhan. I mean, that says plenty already, doesn't it? Hadith number two. Fatima to Sayyida to Nisa'i Ahlil Jannah. So of course you know that they're going to try and twist it and create some kind of justification or context that's going to change the meaning of these ahadith. Of course. Like we'd be insulted if, if they at least didn't try. So they do, obviously. In every sharh of Bukhari, there are Plenty of attempts to try and twist and turn the meanings of these actual ahadith. But still, after the dust settles, you can't, if you're looking for the truth, if you're a true, genuine seeker of the unadulterated truth, then you'll find it, even in the midst of this confusion and manipulation. She's a part of me. Man aadaha faqad aadani. Whoever hurts her, whoever angers her, man aghdabaha faqad aghdabani. Right? In other versions of the hadith, which Bukhari doesn't mention, but others do, like Muttaqil Hindi and others, the Prophet goes into more detail. Man aghdabaha faqad aghdaballah. 
فاطمة سيدة نساء العالمين من الأولين والآخرين because when it comes to Sayyidat Nisa Ahl al Jannah, they've tried to twist that and say, oh, but Maryam is better because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Al Alameen. When in this hadith the Prophet says, Sayyidat Nisa Al Jannah. But the truth of the matter is, if you are the best among people in this world, and you have someone who is the best among those in paradise, which one do you think is better and superior? If Fatima al Zahra is the mistress of the women in paradise, that makes her the mistress of Maryam herself. All it needs is a little sincerity. And for people to set aside their biases, to set aside their prejudices, to set aside any pre, um, preconditions, right? Any predeterminations. Just set those aside. Think objectively, ask Allah for guidance and you'll find it. So, this is who Fatima to Zahra is. The question I want to ask tonight and hopefully talk a little bit about this, because it does have practical implications, is this. In the ziyara of Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam, it's only about three or four lines. In that ziyara, which is I think the only ziyara that's attributed to the infallible Imams. All the other ziyarat that we have were probably written by leading scholars and you know it's okay, they're worthy of being recited, that's, there's no problem there. But the actual ziyarat of Fatima to Zahra is very short and there's only one of them perhaps as an indication and a reminder of the fact that the grave of Fatima to Zahra is missing. That there really is no place you can go to where you could say that I performed the ziyara of Fatima to Zahra And yet in this very brief text, we have a statement which should really recalibrate our view of Fatima to Zahra It starts off like this, Ya mumtahanatu allati امتحنك الله الذي خلقك قبل أن يخلقك. You are the one. This is one of the names of Fatima al Zahra. Mumtahana, the one who was tried and tested, right? When you want to talk about a good product or a good solution, right? You say this has been tried and tested. Fatima al Zahra was tried and tested by who? By the one who created you before he created you. Allah Akbar. الذي امتحنك قبل أن يخلقك فوجدك لما امتحنك صابرة and he found you to be worthy of this position he found you to be patient vis-a-vis -vis this test and this trial this great test of Allah سبحانه وتعالى وزعمنا أن لك أولياء ومصدقون وصابرون and now we claim that we are among your partisans, Ya Fatima al Zahra, Ya Binta Rasulullah. We think that we are worthy of being among your followers and people who will believe you and people who will stand with you. So we ask you, Ya Fatima al Zahra, that if we are true to our word, if we mean what we say, and that we follow the sunnah and the tradition of your father, the holy messenger, and your husband, his successor, Ali ibn Abi Talib, that you bless us so that we could then give ourselves glad tidings. لِنُبَشِّرَ أَنفُسَنَا بِأَنَّا قَدْ طَهُرْنَا بِوِلَايَتِكَ So that we could get our, ourselves glad tidings that we have been purified by your partisanship, by your fellowship. Perhaps we can call ourselves Fatimiyun. Perhaps we can claim that we are aligned with Fatima, with the wishes of Fatima, the desires of Fatima, the objectives of Fatima, and the lifestyle of Fatima alayhi salatu wasalam. Give us this backing, give us this blessing. Right? Now the question really is, how do we do that? How do we achieve that station? That position of being among the awliya, of Fatima alayhi salatu wasalam. The answer 
is very simple. In fact, it's easier said than done. But we have to talk about it. We have to address these points as inspiration so that we could be better followers of Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. The first way you can be among the awliya of Fatima and those who are partisans and followers of this great lady is through knowledge. And we could talk about this all night, but the fact of the matter is, brothers and sisters, we really lack knowledge about Fatima to Zahra. We don't really know about her. And part of that, I think there are two reasons, which I will mention, that are not directly things you can blame on ourselves. Right? So I'm going to take the responsibility off of you for a moment here. One of the reasons we lack knowledge about Fatima to Zahra is because the pulpits, especially in the English language, lack a true methodology and mechanism to deliver the knowledge of Fatima to Zahra to the people. The English language member is a tragedy in its own right. And that's something we have to address and talk about on other occasions. But the fact of the matter is, it is tragic, it is extremely disappointing to see people who sit on this blessed institution. It's not just a chair, it's not a piece of furniture. It's an entire institution. To sit here for an hour and hardly mention a hadith of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim wassalam. I'arifu manazil shi'atina. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says, ala qadari riwayatihim anna. You want to find a surefire way of evaluating the followers of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim wassalam to see what their true worth is. See how many times and how often they narrate the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim wassalam. And so part of the problem is not your fault. It's the fault of people like me. People who fail to deliver this knowledge to the audience. The second reason this happens is because by her very essence, Fatima to Zahra is enigmatic. There is a mystique. I said this in Washington a few years ago at a conference. I said, think about the fact that when you reach the discussion of Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam, there is this mystique, this elusive nature that you can't just quite put your finger on it. You don't quite understand or, or know or have the capacity to, to comprehend who Fatima to Zahra was and that was a feature of her creation. It's by design. إِنَّمَا سُمِّيَتْ فَاطِمَةْ Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says, لِأَنَّ الْخَلْقَ فُطِمُوا عَمَّ عَرِفَتِهَا الْخَلْقَ Not just humans, but that includes angels, it includes prophets, it includes everybody else. فُطِمُوا فُطِمُوا means they've been severed. There's no way you can fully understand the essence of Fatima to Zahra. The hadith says, and I don't want to get into these things because again, they're very enigmatic, they're difficult to understand. But just to give you a taste and a sense of what we're dealing with here when talking about Fatima. And to give you a sense of what they did when they ambushed her house. What they violated. Who they attacked. The hadith says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the light of Fatima. Darkness was removed from the angels. The angels said, Ay Rabb, Ilahana, Sayyidana. What is that? What is that light that just penetrated every corner of the universe and lifted the darkness? فَقَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى إِنَّهَا فَاطِمَةً خَلَقْتُهَا مِن نُورِي وَأَسْكَنْتُهَا سَمَائِي I created her from my light. There is no veil between her and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She's as close as a creation can get to God. وَأَسْكَنْتُهَا سَمَائِي My heaven, my sky, not all the heavens, but mine. وَأَخْلُقُ مِن نُورِهَا نُورَ الْأَئِمَّةِ السلام, I, wish I shall create the imams, my vicegerents, my representatives from this light. This is who Fatima to Zahra is, which is not saying much because 
again, it's mystifying. It's incredibly confusing. What does that actually mean? We have no idea. So what does it take for us to become followers of Fatima to Zahra? Number one, getting to know her. Trying to understand the lifestyle that she led. Trying to understand the sacrifices that she made. Trying to recognize her sermon. Al Khutbatul al Fadakiya, Ibn Abil Hadid al Mu'tazili, in his commentary on Nahjul Balagha, quotes this from Zayd ibn Ali, Ibn al Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib, Zayd al Shahid. He says, Someone said to Zayd, this, this sermon looks like a fabrication. Because number one, it completely undresses the enemies of Fatima al Zahra. It strips them naked and exposes them for who they were. And so again, it's uncomfortable. Number two, the eloquence of the sermon is just mind-boggling. In fact, one of the earliest sources that mentions Al-Khutbah al fadakiyah if somebody ever asks you where this came from, tell them that it comes from one of the earliest sources, one of the earliest books that were compiled in Islam in the third century after Hijrah. A book by the name of Balaghatun Nisa. And the book is about the eloquence of women. Things that women had said that were eloquent and beautiful. And had elegant rhetorical structures and whatnot, right? In that book, he narrates this sermon. So he says, Ibn Abi Hadid says, that they asked Zayd ibn Ali, this sermon doesn't make sense. He said to them, listen, we in Al Abi Talib, our entire tribe, they have narrated this sermon generation after generation. And in fact, inna we teach it to our children. It's not something that we came up with. This has been around for generations since the time of Fatima herself. How much do we really know about this sermon? Have we even sat down to read through the sermon from beginning to end? Or have we just heard snippets here and there? So you see what I mean? Let's elevate our knowledge of Fatima to Zahra in an attempt to become closer and closer to her. Right? I said this about Sahifa Sajjadiyya a couple of years ago in London. I said, why is it that we don't have people who do their PhD dissertations on Sahifa Sajjadiyya? Or on al khutbah al fadakiyya Why is it that we have Muslims, well-meaning Shia, go to universities, study in the field of humanities, but end up never contributing to these studies? Never introducing the Ahlul Bayt السلام, to the academic world. If you must get into the humanities stream at universities, which is not something that I recommend, because the entire system is structured to cast doubt in your mind, and it runs contrary to religious belief in principle. But if you must, and if you happen to be there, you might as well pick an angle that serves the Imam of the time, that serves the cause of the Ahlul Bayt, and fulfill the hadith, Rahimallahu man ahya amrana. Qala kayfa nuhyi amrakum ya ibn Rasulullah. The man asked the Imam, Imam al Ridha alayhi salam, how do we revive your cause? How do we serve your, 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 your mission? The Imam said, Yata'allamu ulumana. To learn our sciences and to teach it to other people. So why don't we have PhDs on the Fadakiya sermon? Why don't we have master dis master's dissertations about the Fadakiya sermon of Fatima to Zahra? There, there, there's, a, there's a big gaping hole. There's a vacuum that needs to be filled. So, you have scholars. Al-Allamatul Amini becomes a partisan and a fellow and a follower of Fatima to Zahra through his Al Ghadir. His son says the Al Ghadir, the existing uh, encyclopedia of Ghadir that we have today, is 10 volumes. His son says the actual size is 20 volumes. The rest hasn't even been published yet. So you see? So the first way to do that is through knowledge, through understanding through acquiring the sciences and the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt salam, in particular, Fatima al-Zahra. Number two, and I won't take too much of your time, it is to follow the example of Fatima. And the example of Fatima, I'll just mention a couple of points here.
the first. And this has to do not just with the sisters, but also the brothers. Because if the brothers maintained their respect of the hijab of our sisters, then sisters would be more compelled to wear the hijab. They'd be inclined, I should say, to wear the hijab. If they saw that their hijab was being honored and respected the way it should be, that they'd have more reason to wear it, especially at times and in places where they're being attacked left, right, and center, where they have every reason to abandon the hijab. But primarily, this has to do with the sisters. After all, Fatima al Zahra is Sayyida to who? Nisa al Alami. She's the mistress of the women of the world, meaning that these are unchanging moral laws. Don't ever listen to someone who tells you that the times have changed, that things are different in this day and age, that Fatima lived in a different time and a different era. Because the hadith says, Nisa al Alameen min al Awaleen wal Akhirin. Which means that these are moral laws. They're fixed, they're unchanging. They're as timeless as the sun and the moon and the universe itself. Look at how sensitive Fatima al Zahra was when it comes to her hijab. You've all heard about the Fadakiya sermon. But do you know the context? Do you know how it began? Listen to this segment and I'll leave you to ponder over it. The hadith says, أن فاطمة لما بلغها أن أبا بكر قد بعث إلى فدك وأخرج عمالها when she heard that Abu Bakr had sent and thrown out the laborers of Fatima to Zahra in the land of Fadak, as soon as she learned about that development, what did she do? فلافت خمارها واشتملت بجلبابها First thing she did was she wore this long hijab that covers not just a part of the head, but the entire top half of the body. Which is a veil that covers the entire body, what we refer to as aba'a today, or chador, or whatever you want to call it. As if that hijab wasn't enough, she adds another layer of protection and veil. She surrounds herself with other women, with her maids, with her servants, with members of her family. means servants. Her dress was so long it would drag on the ground. Layer number four. She walked with grace just like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi hatta dakhalat al masjid. Was that enough? Look at how sensitive the issue of hijab was in the eyes of Fatima. Thumma dhahabat fajalasat. She wasn't standing up, she sat down. So layer number what? Six or seven? I lost count. They put up a curtain to cover Fatima to Zahra so as not to be seen by the audience. You see, people now talk about, yeah, Fatima to Zahra, she was out there, she was giving lectures and sermons. But when you take all of these details into consideration, you get a very different picture indeed, don't you? She then released a sigh of grief from her heart that made everyone burst into tears. They all remembered the tragedy of Rasulullah. They remembered the great loss of the Messenger. They remembered their lack of support for Fatima and Ali when her home was ambushed. They remembered the 40 nights that Fatima to Zahra would go knocking on doors. Allahu Akbar. Knocking on door after door saying, you gave your pledge of allegiance to Ali on Ghadir. And now is the day you fulfill that pledge. You promised Rasulullah to stand by us. You told Rasulullah that we want to compensate you for your services and the Prophet revealed the verse to you قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى 
You told the Prophet that we will look after your family, that we will take care of them, that we will stand by Ali, door after door. This is the one tragedy that breaks every heart, brothers and sisters. That Fatima would be the one to have to knock on these doors and ask them to fulfill what they owe to Rasulullah and to God Himself. She then delivered her sermon. She exposed the hypocrites. She literally told them that you're trying to restore the jahiliya. She stripped them naked forever, such that the stain could never be removed from the annals of history. No one can forget the fact that they ambushed the house of Fatima al Zahra. أَيُضْرَمُ النَّارُ بِبَابِ دَارِهَا وَآيَةُ النُّورِ عَلَى مَنَارِهَا Ayatullah al-Asfahani is the one who wrote these verses of poetry. He says, is it even possible? This house is the house that Allah refers to in Surah An-Nur. فِي بُيُوتٍ أَذِنَ اللَّهُ أَن تُرْفَعَ وَيُذْكَرَ فِيهَا اسْمُهُ these are the houses of Rasulullah, and yet they set the house on fire. You know what is worse than setting the house on fire? It was breaking the ribs of Fatima. They waited until the door was fully burnt. When they realized that they could now tear it down, that is when he pushed the door. He said in his letter to Muawiyah, as soon as I felt Fatima behind the door, I heard her cry. What was the thing that Fatima said? She said, Abatah, Ya Rasul Allah, Ahakada, Yufalu, Behabibatik, Ya Fidda, Ilayki, Khudini, Fakad, he says to Muawiyah, when I heard her voice, I was about to sympathize with her for the Muhammad, but I remembered the magic of Muhammad, so I pushed as hard as I could. a friend of mine lost his wife last year. His wife was giving birth, but she died in her labor. She died in her childbirth. It was very tragic. But there was one thing that he told me which shattered my heart into pieces. He said that when I got back home after my wife died and we left her in the hospital that night, I came back to my house. My young four-year-old daughter, Zainab, she said to me, Daddy, where is my mom? You said you were going to go and bring me a new brother. I don't have a brother and I don't have my mother anymore. Where is mommy today? My friend was saying to me, he said, Sayyid, I don't know what to say to my daughter. Would I tell her that your brother died? Would I tell her that your mother died? How could I face my daughter? It's been one week and she still doesn't know anything. Now I ask you, when Amir al muminin buried his sweetheart Fatima al-Zahra in her grave, in 
the darkness of that night, when he got back home, how would he face his daughter Zainab alayhi salam? Instead, Amir al Mu'mineen looked towards the direction of the shrine of Rasulullah. He said, Assalamu alaykum ya Rasulullah. Hadhi ibn Tuk, Alati kanat sari atal haqibik. Assalamu alaykum wa ala ibnatik sari atal haqibik. He said, Salam to Rasulullah. Ya Rasulullah. لقد قل عن صفيتك صبري ورق عنها تجلدي in that Amir al-Mu'mineen is teaching Zainab a lesson. He's teaching her that when the tragedy reaches its climax, you must turn to Rasulullah, which is what Zainab did on the day of Ashura. She turned towards Medina. Assalamu alaik ya Rasulullah. Hadha Husaynuk bil فاطمة عليها السلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وهو في حالة الاحتضار فانكبت عليه تبكي ففتح عينيه وأفاق ثم قال صلى الله عليه وآله يا بني أنت المظلومة بعدي وأنت المستضعفة بعدي فمن آذاك فقد آذاني ومن غاضك فقد غاضني ومن سرك فقد سرني ومن برك فقد برني اللهم صل على الصديقة الزكية حبيبة نبيك وأم أحبائك و